Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for everybody coming out. It has been a fantastic year. Uh, uh, shout out to the Chamber of Commerce, all the great work they're doing, all the new members. Uh, do we have any brand new members uh, that are just in the last, uh, just in this past year? Last 30 minutes. <laughs> right on. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, all right. That's fantastic. Welcome. This is a great organization, a great networking opportunity to be able to share your business, a great network of friends. And uh, what I really love about this organization is really a, a form of community that they develop amongst the business owners to be able to address the problems that they uh, encounter, uh, the challenges that face staying open as a business, and uh, moving forward and growing your business. So we look very much forward to working with you as a city and uh, whatever we can do on the city's behalf to be able to make uh, the environment more pro-business, we're, we're very happy to do that. Uh, this year is marks the end of today, well, this month marks the end of the first year of my uh, tenure as uh, mayor, and um, it has been a fantastic year. It's been very busy, of course. Uh, when I got elected, I had identified 53 major areas that needed to be addressed, in my opinion. And over this first year, we have implemented 49 of them. So it has been tremendously busy. busy. Uh, we have just a few left, and some of them are very big ticket, large, uh, items and certainly if anybody watched Channel 4 you realize we're in the middle of uh, addressing dispatch services and we'll talk about that in a little bit but that's uh, one of the remaining four. We've also uh, implemented nearly a hundred minor adjustments along the way uh, just fine-tuning some of the things that are, are working but need to be adjusted a little bit. Uh, and of course success in any campaign was based on building relationships that's how I built and I believe how I won in my campaign was trying to go around and build up a relationship with each and every person I could reach into. And I, I reached out and talked with 2,400 households during the campaign of about 3,000, 3,100 households in the Lotus area. And I truly feel that the key to success is relationship. And once I got elected, I really carried that forward and realized that the key to success is as a community is to build relationships and restore relationships. And that's really the first point I wanted to make. Uh, first thing we did as the city of Lotus, we reinstituted our Chamber of Commerce membership. So uh, they, for some reason it had lapsed and we wanted to make that right and be a part of that. Uh, we restored the relationship with the Lotus Festival Association and even moved our July 4th uh, celebration over there, uh, which expanded. We had about usually about a thousand, twelve hundred that would show up at City Hall, and estimates range anywhere from five to six thousand people showed up because we had the capacity to be able to handle that. So a lot more people could get involved with our celebrations. Restored our relationship with HEB by allowing the fire department to resume shopping there. Uh, the previous administration had stopped that, and uh, since then, HEB such an important partner. Uh, they had traditionally sponsored many of our events, and uh, they are once again a, a key sponsor in all of our community events. As you can see, some of uh, uh, this particular banner came from our uh, cr uh, Christmas celebration, correct? Uh, where's uh, yeah, our Christmas celebration? You can see some of our major sponsors that came out for that event. Uh, we restored relationships with our fire district, the ESD 7 and 8. Uh, one of the first meetings I had was with brought both of their chiefs over there and kind of redefined how we can do mutual aid, which is uh, common. Uh, fires often require multiple units to respond and no one particular small department has enough resources for a large house fire. And so it's important to have strong relationships with the surrounding area district uh, fire uh, stations. And so uh, we have an excellent working relationship at this point. Casa Holotis, which of course is our senior activity center. I'm happy to say that for the very first time in the history of Holotis, we found a way to be able to support them and we were able to give them a thousand dollar check and it was great to uh, support a uh, organization that provides services to the entire community and that was really the way to be able to do it. And often uh, the key to being able to uh, move forward in, in projects is to be able to have the fortitude to dig and find a way to be able to do it. Where there's a will, there's a way. And uh, I determined that there needed to be a will <laughs> to find a way to be able to help uh, that organization. Uh, O'Connor High School as a new principal. I've met with him. He's come to my office. We developed uh, a great relationship. I've gone and uh, 
participated and sat with him at several concerts and uh, events ahead of the school. And we even developed an O'Connor internship program where uh, uh, last year's Miss Lotus uh, uh, took it upon her to really push and, and interview and she's done an excellent job helping us with uh, the uh, uh, lighting of the lights, the uh, Christmas parade, and now working heavily on the uh, corny ball parade. And so it was a uh, uh, new initiative. Of course, uh, building relationships with Vulcan. I know there's a lot of people that uh, really uh, complain about the earthquake and uh, just briefly, I, I ended up putting a seismograph in my backyard. I live in Iron Horse Canyon and so we could uh, you know, go to that far extent to show and make sure that they're uh, within limits, as it were, uh, but, uh, and they are, by the way, they are well within limits, but uh, at the same point, to be able to draw that tie between the businesses in the area and the residents and to address the complaints and find out what is a legitimate complaint to address those issues and move forward. Uh, of course, Great Holos Little League, uh, work with them. Uh, we, uh, unfortunately, I couldn't throw out that first pitch because my uh, son was uh, at state championship state finals for saxophone quartet at the same time but uh, uh, and then of course with the Los Reyes schools and uh, the Boy Scouts in America just really developing the relationships going out and speaking at their events and involving them even though Los Reyes is outside city limits uh, one of the things that I've really embraced is to look at Holotus not just if you're inside the box of our, of our uh, community but to define community as the surrounding areas because People that live just out the city limits, they're in Old Town all the time as well. We need to pay attention to all the people, just like your customers. You know, you know, if your customers are Lotus, you're not going to turn down customers who are just outside of a Lotus, and that's the way we kind of uh, uh, look at that as well. But uh, so, what did that result with? Uh, when we take a look at the health of the city, you really kind of have to start and stop at finances. I shouldn't say stop; you certainly start at finances, and. Uh, uh, this is uh, Tammy Durr, she's our uh, finance guru. Uh, we have a balanced budget this year, $7.3 million. Some may say, well, that seems less than what it used to be. And it did, it used to be like 8.9. But part of that was because they were not really counting funds correctly. We have a 380 agreement uh, with one of our largest uh, uh, businesses in the area where we agreed to give back certain sales tax dollars. And so we accounted it for it correctly. Uh, and so net, we have a $7.3 million budget and it's completely balanced, and uh, so much so that uh, this last year we got, uh, we do an audit every year, and uh, this year for the very first time we won the Governmental Finance Officers Association Certificate of Achievement. This is the highest honor that they give, and we won it now for the very first time in Lotus history. We uh, paid off a developer lawsuit, one of my uh, key campaign platforms that would be no more frivolous lawsuits. The last one cost us an awful lot. It's now paid off, and now we're spending some of that money to pay down debt, and when we pay down debt, that reduces our property taxes. So you can look forward to a lot more of that. Uh, we have ARPA funding of projects. Uh, we got a lot of projects, including some uh, road and drainage con uh, construction projects that will be coming down the, the pathway. Uh, some uh, police cars that we're gonna be able to fund through that. Uh, there's a litany of additional projects. The bottom line, we're being able to use money that's available so we don't have to pull out of our tax base uh, to cover these needed expenses. And of course, we talked about Casa Lotus already. So here's where it shows, and we get a little pointer here. I'd like to take credit for everything, but I can't and I won't. But right about there is where we got elected on our sales tax dollars. And then we shot up this past year uh, for our sales tax of uh, 4.3 million. That's our sales and use tax, 2.1 million for our economic development and uh, just over a million for our street maintenance fund. And so when we have sales and use tax increase, uh, and you can see that, and here's the specific dollars of our total sales tax, and I'll show you right there where the election is. For the very first time, we got elected at the beginning of May, and the very first time we ever went over $700,000 that first month. So that was, a, that was a nice start to the year. And we continue to go from there, uh, approaching 800,000 for the very first time in the history. Again, we're over a million dollars in sales tax as of March, uh, for, for the month of March. So we're seeing some fantastic growth. I think people are excited to be uh, part of our community. I can't tell you how many people come into the office and we're really excited about what's going on, what can we do to get involved, and uh, really seeking to expand their business, and uh, it's being met with uh, uh, great optimism. And as a result, as a percentage of our total budget that's being relied upon by property taxes, that is decreasing. 
So the amount, we're only down to 37% of our budget comes from property tax. And our property tax rate, we continued and we dropped it down. It doesn't really show the, the fraction of the decrease we had there, but it was, it was fractionally less and that was due to the debt that we paid off. This all is a result of a lot of the development we're doing within the city. And uh, there's three of our key city development personnel. Uh, we got market days back to 100%. Uh, we did that as of July of last year. Uh, we've resurfaced a lot of the roads, including an Iron Horse Canyon and uh, Hunter's Ridge, but we also have uh, upcoming projects in other communities as well coming up this next year. Uh, we've got a tech stock project. A lot of you know that 1560 is going to be going from the small road that it is now into two lanes both ways, plus a turn lane in the middle, plus bike lanes, plus sidewalks. It's a lot of construction, and we were going to be responsible for our portion of it nearly $300,000. did a little bit more research, and we got that. Now the cost to the city of Lotus on that portion is under $100,000. And so that's good, we, you know, minimizing our cost and exposure of when those projects actually happen. We have a project happening uh, with TxDOT around Diamond K. We all know that there was fatalities in that area, and it's a dangerous intersection for uh, leapfrogging and across there to, to head southbound on uh, 16. Uh, so that will be starting hopefully this summer and completion this fall. Uh, so there'll end up being a little turn lane, forced turn lane. You'll still be able to U-turn there as you're coming up Bandera. You'll still be able to U-turn and come back down, but you won't be able to leapfrog across uh, Highway 16 there. We have a new contract in Old Town. Uh, uh, working with uh, Ken Dempsey, of course, as you know, owns a lot of Old Town. And uh, we've got contractor services to maintain a, a consistent market days experience. And with that, we uh, got a contract for 24-7 use of the uh, restrooms in Old Town and a, uh, make sure that we keep those uh, uh, clean and good, good order. And we uh, completed a four and a half million dollar drainage project. Uh, that was uh, the uh, French Creek drainage project that was with uh, a lot of work with Bear County, but uh, now we have to accept that. And we have uh, some final tree uh, issues and planting some trees there that got taken out and uh, Part of that goes with the tree ordinance. I put a video on before that we may take trees out in certain areas, but it requires us to put back certain trees in the same area, other trees in other areas. So we end up being kind of net as a community, uh, same amount of trees throughout the throughout the Lotus area. And of course, we've had a lot of new businesses this year. Look at all those new businesses came into town. Quite a few of them, small, medium, large, everything from a hospital. One of the people asked me on, a, on my campaign, "Can't we have a hospital built here?" I'm like, well, that's a big ask. Uh, we'll, we'll put it in the put it in the hopper. Sure enough, we got a children's hospital and emergency room uh, as well. Uh, go through each one of the great people involved with this. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, we're good there. So, anyways, as you can see, uh, of course, I don't know if anybody hasn't been to Mary's Taco. That's great, but every single one of these uh, organizations has been great. Uh, I won't point out, but my son works at one of these places. Also great food. Administration. Uh, I, as my, some of you I met today didn't realize, my full-time job, I'm actually a firefighter for the city of San Antonio. That's what pays the bills. And I spent about 70 hours a week working there and dealing with COVID was just a tremendous uh, pain in the tushy. Uh, masks, people's various opinions on that. I took a stance here. I support your right to choose, quite honestly, flat out. You want to wear a mask, God bless you, throw it on there, I'll support your right, but I'm not going to hear mandate you to wear a mask, and I made that stance. It's kind of passe at this point in the game, but it was monumental at the time I made the decision. <coughs> we were never going to force you to have vaccinations or, or masks, and I will continue to hold that uh, uh, until they drag, drag me away. Make city council's meetings 100% public and lifted that restriction for my very first meeting. Uh, we authorized planning and zoning to have decision authority. So before, you know, many of you went, had to have a sign, you know, it was approved by P&Z, then it had to go to city council to get their stamp of approval on. That was just redundant. If it fit within the box of the ordinance, P&Z now has the authority to be able to approve it so nobody has to go through a second meeting and just drag out the box. We need to make things more efficient for you as business owners. We have a new waste and recycle contract. Uh, C6 did win it. It was a competitive bid. We had five major bidders on that. It was an extremely competitive, a very difficult decision, but in the end, as far as cost and total services, C6 won that, and that will uh, kick off with a July 1 start date for that new contract, and there'll be some uh, 
Most of the changes will be residential, won't affect the commercial, but uh, we'll be sending out communications in the mail with that. We've uh, worked hard to decrease permit cost, and we've streamlined the permit process, and we even instituted an ethics commission. Thank God we haven't had any need to use it as of this point, uh, because we are all acting appropriately. Uh, but if there is ever an uh, instance, we can certainly, uh, we have the committee to be able to address that. This is probably one of the biggest <laughs> issues, redesigned healthcare. Healthcare is such a big, huge problem, and uh, I was not prepared to accept what was being given down the pipe to us. They told us we were gonna have 30% increase in cost this year, last year, or October. I just was not gonna accept that. So we had to get to work and I had to think outside of the box and came up with an idea, floated it, and in a sense, we found a new way and redefined how we handle healthcare. In short, I'll give you the nuts and bolts of it because maybe you can use it for yourself. What we did is, uh, as costs increase, there's always cost increase, but and as claims increase, that all figures, figures into the calculus to come up with your next year's uh, uh, premiums, right? And those premiums kept going up. So what we did is we had to, we couldn't keep the same policy we had, we just didn't, couldn't afford it. So what we did is we picked a, a worse front end plan, all right, with higher deductibles and, and you know, just not as great a network. And that was a terrible thing, but it brought it at a lower cost. And then I took the money and I bought a subscription service to uh, what turned out to be open bid and who won that was uh, Prestige ER and their urgent care. So now for a flat rate, they can go there with whatever the cost is, we pay a subscription fee, a small monthly payment, and that allows all of those claims to be paid by uh, the subscription service so it doesn't even get filed on our insurance claims. So the first report we got back just recently is that Last year, we were at 130% of what our billings were supposed to be. And just after six months, we have brought that down to 80%. So we've had a 50% uh, uh, drop in what our claims were. That, so we look forward to a much better insurance plan in the future. So uh, this has worked so well that uh, US Congressman uh, Tony Gonzalez was watching what we were doing. And he got me in touch with their people in DC. And they had me write a white paper on it for consideration there delving into it uh, because there's really some uh, points that not just that plan, but some of my other ideas on how we solve some of our healthcare crisis, but we're working on that too. We wanna affect not only our community, which is our primary, but we wanna hopefully be a voice for, for good, maybe on a national platform, we'll see. I don't want a national office, I'm just saying I wanna fix things, that's all. <laughs> um, I will talk a little bit about the ICMA conference, uh, but that's the International City Managers Association conference. I went to that in Oregon. I have some specific things about that I'll talk about later. And Marion went to the TML conference, uh, Texas Municipal League conference, and uh, that was Houston, correct? Uh, okay. Uh, and obviously, we want to focus with a coordination and cooperation with the Lotus Economic Development Corporation, uh, who helps bring businesses in. Of course, the Chamber of Commerce that helps figure out how to handle business problems. And of course, as the third part of that chain is being city and being able to address ordinances to help make your lives better. Our police department, uh, we were ranked as a city as the ninth safest city in Texas. Uh, San Antonio out of 280 was like 278 or something like that. Uh, when that came out in the newspaper, uh, I was uh, proud to be a Lotus resident at that point for sure. I've always been proud, been, always been Lotus proud, but uh, uh, we were the number one safest city in Bear County for two years in a row. And we've instituted a new warrant collections program. Uh, we're addressing uh, police department pay and turnover issues. Of course, that whole national narrative of defund police, I am not down with that at all. It is the wrong way to address. And as a matter of fact, uh, we got up into that city manager's uh, association meeting and went to their annual conference. So many of the topics were, well, we defunded police, now what? Because then now they had a whole host of other pro uh, problems to deal with. Uh, we're just not gonna let that problem happen here, period. We're gonna support our police empire. Uh, we had continued excellence services. We had two acts of valor certificates we gave out recently. A police officer's going into a burning house and pulling out uh, uh, person and animals, quite honestly. Uh, great, great courage on our police department. But despite our massive growth in annexation, we have added no new police in the last 10 years. And that just, I don't think there's anybody that can say, well, that seems right. That just doesn't seem right. 
and I receive more calls than anything else is, hey, we have speeders coming down our road, can you send a police over here? But I get that from 14 different communities. And then as soon as we rotate what few people we have left, we only have, of our police force, only three officers at a time are patrolling the road per shift. You got multiple shifts, and then you also have their uh, the sergeant and the chief, et cetera, that makes the total staffing. That's just not enough, not for the growth we've had in 10 years. Some of you real remember I had floated a quarter percent sales tax increase, uh, went out to public vote. It lost because 46% uh, to 54%, which represents just if 29 people had changed their mind, it would have passed. This amount would have mostly been paid for by San Antonio residents and area residents. Two thirds of it is paid by outside people traveling into businesses that they're buying, uh, business services that they're buying. Uh, so it would have only affected our households about $12 a year, not much. What it would have done, it would have allowed us to hire uh, three or four police officers just like that. Voted down and uh, I still get constant phone calls. Can you please send a police over here? I would love to, but as soon as there's an accident on Brown Road, which there is every single morning, there's two of our officers right there. We got one left <laughs> for the entire city. Where would you like me to go? So it's a real problem. I ask that you consider this amongst your your, uh, yourselves, your employees, anybody else that you know in Pelotas, because this will probably come up. It's my, I'm not stating city business, I'm stating my position, my position, and I'm gonna push for this because I think it's the right thing to, to provide sustainable and uh, needed services for our community. Uh, fire department, I developed an open door policy for Pelotas Fire Department. And that uh, sparked me to, with one or so well, I decided to go ahead and have a de facto meet and confer. Some of you know what that is. Uh, it's uh, kind of between city just telling you what's up and the other end is uh, uh, having uh, union associations. So in the middle is kind of meet and confer where we come bring the officers together and chiefs together, we sit around the table, we just talk it out and hash out. And that has resulted in drastically improved communications with the fire department and uh, city hall. Uh, we've been uh, effective in being able to increase our pay and benefits so we can be competitive, or more competitive, I should say, we still have some ways to go. Uh, we established a fire shift commander. Uh, Eddie Hayes is uh, now officially recognized as uh, our uh, shift commander there to be able to handle squabbles or differences amongst the three A, B, and C shifts. We've had some station improvements with our HVAC and some water. We've got some new cutting edge equipment. A tick, which is a thermal, thermal imaging camera, so we can see hot spots in our completely smoked out room. Uh, King Vision video laryngoscope, uh, so they can stick a camera down your throat and see where, what you're choking on and, uh, you know, hope you live. Hopefully you'll never have to know what that is uh, in person. And a striker service agreement for our, our uh, stretchers. Uh, we readjusted our, readjusted our pricing so we can be competitive. Wasn't like we're losing money, it's just uh, we are charging a dollar for gas while everybody else is charging three dollars for gas. And we have to adjust that pricing to be uh, market pricing. And that has resulted in a significant increase in uh, revenues from the fire department. And we're also in the process of uh, filing a SAFER grant. That's a federal grant to be able to allow us to hire two additional firefighters. We're waiting to hear on that, but they'll cover the cost for essentially the first four years. By that time, we'll have more houses built in Bricewood. We'll have the four years from now, we'll have the funds to be able to pick up that tab. It allows us to be able to get those workers now paid for by a grant and uh, make efficient use of our money. Public Works, 1,400 calls for service. A lot of calls <laughs> for roughly 12,000 people, right? But one per 10, a service call of that. We resurfaced over a million square feet of road. Uh, we kept our street maintenance under budget. Uh, we added a new employee. We started community cleanup events, uh, and I'd like to shout out to somebody here with blush if I did, but uh, Councilman Craig Sanders does an excellent job. You see him at almost every chance he gets. He's out there with his headphones on. It's his quiet time. He's picking up garbage, trying to lead by example, but uh, doing a great job. And we have some uh, community groups that are following suit. We launched an Oak Wilt mitigation program. Uh, we received zero demer uh, demerits on our TCEQ annual report, and that's just Absolutely amazing. I'll give a shout out to our public works director, <coughs> Josh Mayer. Amazing man. Absolutely. He's a certified arborist, uh, handles all our uh, road construction. They grade our streets to make sure that they are, that we repair them, or excuse me, that we enhance them before they need to repair. So, unlike San Antonio, where 
every single street is under construction every single day. <laughs> we can eliminate that by proper maintenance. Uh, we're in compliance with CH uh, Chapter 94 Vegetation Code, which uh, I just won't even bother going into, but bottom line, he's doing a lot of paperwork and keeping track of uh, where we are vegetation-wise. Uh, all of our public works personnel are FEMA certified, and we had 240 stormwater and MS4 inspections. Those guys are working on it. You guys get ridiculous bang for the buck out of our public works people. Uh, our street improvements that we're using, we're using what's called HI, HA5 Mastic and uh, microsurfing. Those are the two main things that we're using. The, the uh, HA5 is like a spray. It just kind of sprays down like a thick spray paint, if you will, and it just reduces the uh, UV. So UV deteriorates the, the oils, and it also seals it so that the water doesn't wash away the oils because once you have broken down oils and uh, broken down, and the water gets through the cracks and goes substrate. And that's what causes potholes, et cetera. So we prevent the water from getting in there and doing damage. The micro surfacing is just think of it as a kind of an ultra th thin paving, but it's much thicker than the HA5, and so it kind of resurfaces the street. Iron Horse Way, the main road, is uh, the micro resurfacing. Uh, dispatch. We have a new dispatch supervisor, Jamie Ostrander. Uh, that's her in the light blue shirt. Uh, we've hired two new employees recently. We're transforming our system to what's called a P25 system. That's a new standard, uh, kind of basically for better, the easiest way to describe it, going off of old radio and kind of going into uh, fiber. It's operating within the computers as opposed to over our standard radio transmissions. Got in the news yesterday. We'll take a minute to talk about this because it's important. Um, I have been vying for a way to be able to maintain our dispatch center, but uh, Unfortunately, uh, it is about three times the cost for the amount of calls that we're uh, providing. And so it provides a significant challenge because we have so many needs in the city for those dollars. So it's not an attack on the quality of our dispatch. Our dispatch is fantastic quality. I want you all to know that. The question is, how do we responsibly pay $9 a gallon for gas when the going rate is $3 a gallon? And city council has come to that determination. I went to uh, commissioner's court yesterday was on live stream and on WOA yesterday, and I'm getting interviewed again today, uh, what we're trying to do. And uh, of course, uh, step one, and their option is to be uh, kind of uh, morphed into uh, Bear County Dispatch, uh, but um, they don't have the capacity to do that. So we're looking at uh, seeking out funding, emergency funding from Bear County, which would allow us to stay open and shift a lot of their calls over to our dispatch center and be integrated that way basically Bear County becoming a very large customer of ours, and that would make our dispatch center finally financially solvent, which is what we set out to do 14 years ago when I was on council when we started this. It has never been financially solvent from day one, and we have an opportunity for that to happen. So stay tuned, watch the news, and you'll find out at the end of that story that would be a tremendous <laughs> victory all the way. But we have no guarantees on how it's gonna go. Uh, municipal Court, uh, they had a Courts Education Center recognition. Uh, they completed and passed our uh, TCIC, and uh, I know there's a way to pronounce that right, but uh, they passed their audits, and they uh, approved uh, citizen access to find case information, case resolution, and to be able to make payments. Uh, again, just increasing efficiencies and customer service uh, in the unfortunate case that you need them. <laughs> uh, and we implemented a warrant resolution in this initiative. Uh, we increased the ways that our uh, Warrant officer can access information, be able to get out there and uh, basically go bust kneecaps to get paid. No, I'm just kidding. We won't bust kneecaps, so we, we kind of rest them, and we have. Uh, if you have warrants outstanding, one of the things I tell my police officers, I said, listen, if they have a warrant outstanding when you pull them over, arrest them. Take their car. These people have warrants have passed the grace period. They have passed the generosity of warrants. They have passed the generosity of the court. They have missed their court date. They have refused to pay. We will not be a city where you can come in under my direction. We will not become a city that you can drive through here and take advantage of our system. Speed and not ever come and uh, pay your ticket. Commit, uh, commit a burglary and not pay your fines or whatever gets us assessed. You'll have your opportunity, we'll treat you, we'll even give you an opportunity to make good and even give you a discount in the process. But outside of that, we'll impound the car. We'll, we'll find a way. 
people need to know this is a nice community. You're going to do crime? Do it elsewhere. You're not going to do it here. And if you do it here, be prepared to pay the piper. Because our job is to protect our citizens, protect our businesses. And I take that very seriously. Uh, moving on. We have some upcoming projects. We talked a little bit about the Diamond Cave Road. We got a lot of festivals and events, and we're trying to bring even more festival and events. So if you have an idea that you would like to see, uh, I know a lot of people want to see the return of Jazz Fest. That's one of the ones I'm really trying to work on. We'll see what happens there. Uh, of course, we talked about dispatch already. Uh, our, we're going to have a new restroom facility at the fitness park, uh, this ongoing street maintenances, and some new businesses, QT and Future Growth. I'll go ahead and take a quick moment to talk about this because uh, there were a few people that were very upset about QT coming in, and I'll, uh, in brief, the preliminary report that was brought to city council was a case of did it fit within the law, our law of our ordinances? And when the answer is yes, you don't really have an option to say no to them because that's discrimination. That's what happened back with the Walmart and why we ended up with the lawsuit and why we had to pay an awful lot of money because we were discriminated against a company that was an acceptable use for that property. I campaigned not to be involved with frivolous lawsuits. There's no way I could encourage denying QT when it fit within the law. A lot of people said, I shouldn't say a lot of people, 11 people said, uh, well, you're gonna destroy the whole nature of Pelotas, and you're gonna destroy our identity. I'm here to say that our identity is not destroyed by the addition of a single business. It may, however, be destroyed if we put 100 businesses up and down Bandera Road. That's a different thing, and that falls on city council to determine how far, how big, and what we end up having Pelotas look like. And we will work very hard to retain the identity of Pelotas, but it doesn't get won or lost by addition of one business. <clears throat> And so that is a that is a topic that we are actively uh, discussing and uh, what will Holotus look like 15, 20, 30 years from now. And I would assure you under the current council, it appears that uh, what you see is what you're gonna keep. Proper government, I'm gonna close with a discussion on this and this goes back to uh, my time at the ICMA meeting in Oregon. Uh, it was an annual conference and uh, everybody was talking about how to increase efficiency. How do we get more out of our programs? How do we build our you know, homeless program? How do we do this and, and, and do more things? And I realized really quick, uh, along with the defund police and eliminate the bad apples, they focus on how to get rid of people. How much money can we spend and, and, and to weed out and we're gonna trash all the police officers to get rid of this one person or turn them into uh, self-policing. And there's some of that that is good. The key phrase that they had here was this, nothing will kill a great employee faster than you watching, watching you tolerate a bad one. And that's a great piece of managerial advice and I encourage every single one of you to take that back to your business. Don't tolerate a bad employee, it destroys morale. And I saw a city manager, I won't name his name, but he was from San Antonio. He said, hey Rich, I said, hey, sir. Uh, and I told him about that because he had missed that particular uh, meeting. He said, man, that's a great quote, can you send that to me? And I did, I sent it to him. I said, now, when you go back to San Antonio, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to take that statement, print it out, and I want you to cross out employee and replace it with citizen. Nothing will kill a great citizen faster than watching you tolerate a bad one. And immediately, he no longer wanted to talk to me. It all shut up. Because it's not, in some cities, it's not about the citizen. And that's clear. And all of those meetings I went to, what was clear was it, Citizen was like, not even on the page. It was all about programs and how can we do this and how can we enhance uh, 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 homeless programs, et cetera, or whatever, social programs. And to be certain, some of those are important. I'm not gonna tear into that completely. But the point is, if you don't put the citizen first, if you don't encourage people to be better citizens, if you don't inspire them to be better in their community, then you have a situation that just eventually circles the drain. And so I started applying that thought process to how I was looking at projects and how I was looking at city management. And I came to the conclusion that governments are just flat out asking the wrong questions, okay? And when we focus on citizens as opposed to, uh, and we should have focused on employees, I'm not saying we should don't focus on employees, but when we start focusing on citizens and, and put each one of our projects up to the measure, does this help our citizen or is it just really tax them? And we'll end up with a whole set of different questions. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. 
okay? People ask me, you know, this applies to taxes, programs, initiatives. True leadership should contemplate the should. What should we be doing? Not just because we can do something. So, for example, and I put a hot topic up there, homeless policies and social programs. I was asked, well, what's your homeless policy? I says, it's very simple, we don't allow it. Well, why don't you build a homeless shelter? Well, if I build a homeless shelter, we'll have homeless and then we'll have a homeless problem. And, and I'm not saying that everybody that's homeless shouldn't be homeless. I have a heart for people that are hurting. But I've also seen with my own eyes the difference of people that are homeless because they are working the best they can and they are falling on hard times and they are in a situation they need to be helped. And that's why we need to be working with strong interaction and relationship with our area of churches and our community as a whole. But there is a whole host of them that are there by, by choice and perhaps some lack of effort. And I'm not going to judge a person on an individual or, you know, or as a group as a whole, but generally speaking, uh, we need to be better and encouraging people to take responsibility for their action, responsibility for themselves, to respect themselves so they get to the point of respecting others. And when you respect yourself enough to be able to respect others, and then you get to the level of respecting others and putting others in front of you, you end up with a stronger community. And a stronger community inspires better citizenship. And better citizenship reduces crime because you would think, oh, look, I can steal that to, why in the world would I do that? What can I do to try to help this guy out, you know? And that's what we enjoy here in Holotus. It's one of the great things I love about our city. And it's one of the things I want to inspire and continue to encourage. Great citizenship. Increased communication with staff and citizens with the ultimate goal to have a higher standard of living enjoyed by a more fulfilled and content population. And that is basically the framework of what you're going to get with me as your mayor. Is to just really grab hold of this whole philosophy asking the right questions and supporting great citizenship, supporting our great businesses, supporting our great citizens, and inspiring people to do better.